Good afternoon. Um, my name is Vicky Nash. I'm Director of Graduate Studies here at the Oxford Internet Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's virtual open day. Uh, I'm here this afternoon with my colleagues to take you through a bit of information about the Oxford Internet Institute, the application process, our degrees, and hopefully to get some questions from those of you that are listening in. Uh, so first of all, some introductions. Uh, over here on my left, we have Ulrika Rauer, who is uh, a DPhil student currently at the OII, but previously one of our MSc students, so wearing two hats, I think, this afternoon. Uh, right next to me, I have Professor Ralph Schroeder, who is course director for the MSc programme. Over here, Dr. Eric Meyer, who's course director for the DPhil programme and soon to be director of graduate studies. And over here, Laura Maynard, who's our graduate administrator, who will deal with any questions, obviously, about the application process. So we have uh, now just under an hour. Um, we're going to start off perhaps by talking a little bit about the Oxford Internet Institute and its situation here in Oxford. I'm hopeful that, that if you've got this far, obviously, you do know a little bit about who we are and what we do already. Um, but it's worth perhaps just emphasising a few facts that perhaps maybe not so easy to glean just by looking at the website. The first is, is obviously that, you know, you may know a little bit about the OII, but it's important not to forget that you'd be applying not just here to our department, but also to the university, to Oxford. And obviously, you know, one of the greatest benefits of being here is that it is a, a truly, truly world-class research university that happens to be situated in a very beautiful city, uh, of which obviously we are actually at the heart, I should say, one St Giles, the best, best address in the city, I think, probably. Um, but in addition, you wouldn't just be applying to those two institutions, if you like, you'd also be applying to a college. And perhaps one of the things we can talk about a bit later on with Ulrika is what it means to be a member of a college in Oxford and what benefits that delivers. The OII itself is a fairly unique institution even within, within Oxford. Um, when I came very much in the very early days of the department, one of the things that attracted me most was that it was being uh, designed, built, established, not just as a, a, if you like, a sort of classic ivory tower academic institution, but as a, a department which would produce high quality academic research that could have significant implications for, for things in the real world, as people used to say, by which they usually meant maybe policy, um, to inform practice in industry, um, and I think that, that that ethos has very much survived since the early days. So if you do apply to the Oxford Internet Institute, you won't be just applying to come somewhere which undertakes, as I say, you know, very, very high quality, excellent academic research at the cutting edge of its field, but ideally applying to undertake research, study, which has you know, very significant implications, um, either for further research of your own, for the furtherance of academic knowledge, or for application, industry, policy making, and so on. Um, the other thing I think I wanted to mention about the Oxford Internet Institute, and we, we sort of never, we, we become a bit of a broken record, I think, talking about this, but it is, it is important to emphasise just how multidisciplinary we really are. People ask us often what this means, um, and I'm very aware that if you don't study in a multidisciplinary department, it can sound a bit strange. It sounds as if, well, you have some people in a little silo, maybe doing some politics work, maybe some in a little silo doing sociology. But that's not what we mean by the term multidisciplinary here at the OAI. What it actually means for us is that our various faculty who do come from this you know, rich variety of backgrounds, um, from sociology, from information studies, from politics, uh, we have others from law, geography, philosophy, uh, psychology, I could go on, I'm not even going to list them all, but that they do genuinely engage in research together, researching common projects of interest from differing perspectives, bringing to, bringing to bear different theoretical frameworks, different methods, um, and it is, it is a sort of really uniquely fertile place, I think, for sort of collaboration across the disciplines. Perhaps the last thing to mention, um, again, that's hard to pick up from the website, maybe Ulrika and the others will talk about this a bit more, though, is also the, 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 the character of the OII. And I have worked in another academic department, in my own doctorate in another department in Oxford. Um, obviously, we work with colleagues elsewhere around the university. And quite frankly, this place has a very different feel. You know, we often used to joke that we were the smallest department in the university. That's no longer true. I think we're now the second smallest, as Ralph tells me. Um, but in many ways, there are benefits to not being enormous. And I think the greatest benefit for us is that we are immensely collegial. Um, as I said, there's a great deal of collaboration. There's a lot of water cooler conversations, coffee machine conversations. Um, but importantly, the, the, so the, the area of community goes beyond that. We're not hierarchical. We heavily involve our, our students, particularly our DFIL students, within our research program and our projects. Uh, and I think, you know, quite frankly, it just has uh, a lovely atmosphere. Um, certainly if you were here at our award ceremony last week drinking Prosecco in our library, you might have thought that anyway. So, um, I'm going to move on now to talk about the courses uh, that are open for application at the moment. And obviously we have two that we're going to discuss. Um, we have a master's course, the MSc in Social Science, the Internet. And we have our DPhil programme, DPhil in Information and Communication and the Social Sciences. I think possibly the longest title, actually, of a PhD in the university, I'm not quite sure. 
to cover the MSc first, so, so what is it, why do it? Um, it's a one year, very intensively taught programme. Um, of that year, students spend uh, typically between 10 and 11 months in Oxford. Uh, and it basically, it takes you through the core concepts, the core theories, the methods and the tools that you would need for really high level analysis of, of internet related uh, topics and research. But it also gives you very specialised knowledge of maybe one or two disciplinary approaches or topic based approaches. And it gives you the opportunity to undertake your own uh, personal research in a thesis of between 10 and 15,000 words. It is designed uh, to fit the, 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 the sort of strange feature of the Oxford year, which is these odd eight-week terms, incredibly intense, absolutely exhausting, um, but very, uh, in, in many ways, very, a very sort of good way to completely immerse yourself in your, in, your, in your studies. So in the first term, which we call Michaelmas here, uh, you would undertake, if you like, the sort of the, the cohort building studies of the, of the year group, which are essentially core methodological training, quite some stats training, um, and for those of you that don't have a strong, method, a strong mathematical background, we do have, um, if you like, some sort of feeder, feeder, feeder courses at the very beginning of term, for those of you that feel less comfortable for that. Um, in addition, we have two more substantive courses. One um, taught by Ralph on social dynamics of the internet, which takes people through the key sort of theories um, and, and the sort of topics of multidisciplinary internet research. It provides a sort of common vocabulary, if you like. The second, internet technology and regulation which helps all our students gain an understanding and appreciation both for the way the internet operates, for its basic architecture, for its history, um, but also importantly for, for the way in which regulation and policy making shape the way that we experience the internet and the way that in turn the internet shapes, if you like, what is possible for policy and regulation. In the second term, uh, we move on to some slightly more so choice-based study. So although we continue to teach methods, students, for example, can choose between advanced quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, in addition, they carry on um, with some, uh, sorry, some, some quantitative or qualitative analysis in addition to the methods course. But they also take two further option courses of their own choosing. I can't remember how many, is it eight or nine we have this year? I didn't I count. Eight. Eight, okay. Um, which largely follow disciplinary um, uh, sort of uh, uh, guidelines, but, but, but not completely. So you might, I won't list them again, they're available on the website, but you might look at digital era government and politics. You might look at the internet economics or law. Um, you might look at ICTs and developments. So or a new one that we just added looks at the role of um, sort of virtual engagement uh, online. So you choose two of those. And in some circumstances, you can also choose to take another course outside the university, uh, sorry, outside the OII instead, but obviously only with the agreement of your supervisor. Finally, in the third term, you will spend most of your time crystallizing the ideas you should have been working on the whole way through around your thesis. Um, this is, I think, a really important element of the degree because one of the things that's very obvious to most of our students on arrival here is quite how many questions there are to answer uh, when researching the internet. Um, many people come with quite clear ideas of what they think they want to study and actually those change quite dramatically over the first term. Um, I don't know whether yours did or I can talk about that maybe later. Um, the important thing with the thesis is that it is a very much self-guided piece of work. So whereas the other two terms people have spent a large amount of time attending classes, lectures, seminars, discussions, writing essays, in that third term the majority of the work, apart from some MSc seminars, will be spent undertaking your own personal research and analysis, working with a supervisor to produce this, this thesis, which you will hand in, I think, on the 1st of August. I'm going to ask Ralph and Eric in a bit to talk about destinations, um, but just a sort of quick note about who tends to arrive at the OI to take this course? What is it? What type of person we're looking for? And I mean, I think that enthuses both Ralph and I is just the sheer variety of, of, of applicants that we receive. So there is no one, you know, path that is most common. We take students straight from degree programs when they may come from the humanities, from, you know, computer science, from law, social sciences. Um, and we've had, I think, a couple of physicists, haven't we? Or, or certainly from the much more scientific end recently. Um, Secondly, though, we're also very keen to take people who've had some periods of time working outside uh, of academia, um, many of whom actually either perceive this as directly applicable to their work or anticipating a career change at the end of it. So again, the point is simply to note that, that, that in many ways we celebrate that diversity and variety, and it's one of the things that actually makes the, co the course discussion so vibrant. And we do genuinely believe, for example, that if you've worked, say, in the internet industry, then your insight's just as relevant and applicable as somebody maybe who's interested in, say, the digital humanities that they've been working on their undergraduate degree. I think it's also worth saying that apart from all these disciplinary varieties, students come from all over the world, obviously, and I think that Good brings point. a huge amount 
to different experiences of the internet of ICTs and so on. No, that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, and maybe just quickly on sort of the funding point for the MSc students, we're very aware we can't compete perhaps with the US on this. We do have an OI scholarship and many of our MSc students have been successful in gaining funding either through the university's central sources or through their own home countries. And we can again perhaps talk about that more in the questions. On to the, the DFIL programme. Um, so maybe not quite so much to say about the DFIL programme, which means you two can chip in with some more comments, actually. Um, the DFIL, obviously, unlike the US system, is very much self-directed and self-guided self, self here. So it, the anticipation is that you would spend between three and four years working at the Oxford Internet Institute on your DFIL, that you would come to us with a clear proposal, which may change slightly, but you come to us with a proposal. It's not something that you, you develop, you feel like, from scratch on arrival. When you would spend your first year typically taking classes in the first two terms, um, in the first term some combination of method teaching and statistics teaching perhaps, um, also a course on social dynamics, again just because we feel that it helps contribute this common vocabulary if you like that I was, that I was mentioning before. But then very much over the rest of that first year um, we expect our students to be identifying with their supervisors any other training needs they have and taking courses where necessary. But other than that they are getting on preparing they're what we call transfer documents, which are essentially a sort of, you know, fully developed proposal, um, which will need to be passed, usually at the end of the first year. Um, beyond that, though, it's worth noting that uh, although we don't expect our students to take regular classes as such, they are expected to contribute to the life of the department. So, for example, we do have a weekly doctoral seminar, which certainly the first two year groups and, and many members of the third contribute to on a regular basis, where they present their own work, they may do uh, mock, mock, uh, mock interviews, they may have conference papers to deliver and so on, and in addition they receive graduate training from, from Eric and other faculty here. Also we obviously have regular seminars within the OII, uh, we have weekday lunchtime seminars for example which both MSc students and DFIL students may attend, but certainly those students who are further on in their DFIL research may also choose to present there. In terms of uh, topic areas, I mean, maybe I might ask Ralph, uh, Eric to say just a little bit more about this in a second, but um, again, there is this huge diversity of interest. Um, just looking, for example, uh, at two that have just been presented for examination this term, one looking at uh, co-production of, of, in the film industry and the impact of the internet on that, uh, another looking at uh, network neutrality and different regular, the impact of different regulatory regimes. So, you know, we could go through another, you know, five or six very different topics just to show to you that the full diversity of the work that our students do. I suppose, if you like, the limiting factor is what can be supervised here. And one of the things that we really stress is that you may have a superb default topic that you want to pursue, but if we don't have somebody suitable to, to supervise that for you, then unfortunately this is not the best place for you. Um, I'm going to ask you to talk about destinations later. I mean, again, maybe just to sort of flag up the, the sort of international nature, perhaps also the DFIL program. Um, we do take DFIL students from, from absolutely uh, all over the world. Um, many of them come with funding from home countries. But for the last couple of years, we, I think we've been successful in gaining funding for, for all of those that haven't brought funding with them. So again, I know on paper it often looks as if we can't compete with the, you know, the top US universities, but certainly on the DFIL front, we've been very successful indeed in obtaining funding for, for the students that we bring in. Um, Eric, anything you would add on the default front that I haven't mentioned? No, I mean, I think one, one of the things that I hear students in other departments and other universities mention is even though this isn't, you, you don't spend a lot of time in classes dealing with other students, you do have a lot of opportunities to interact with your cohort of, of doctoral students. You know, there's the seminar that meets regularly, but also, you know, they meet together for breakfast and other events mm -hmm. and so forth to get to know each other's work. And so it's very much not a lonely, alienating experience that some people in, in other places might, might experience on, on a DPhil um, or a PhD. So I think that that's something that we do bring, even though we come from a variety of backgrounds, it's not like people then separate into their own little corners. They, they very much are participating in the intellectual life of the department and with their peers. Absolutely. It's also worth noting that uh, a fairly recent development within Oxford has been the establishment of something called the Doctoral Training Centre, which now means that in addition to the, the network of scholars within the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, DPhil students also now have a much wider network across, in our case, the Social Sciences Division, um, but also I think to some degree beyond it we're also now offering training, for example, uh, in conjunction with say, the Humanities Division, uh, Eric's doing that. So what this means in practice though is that students can draw on a wealth of resources, not just within our department, but also within other departments here. And there are many, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite highly designed graduate training seminars and sessions now offered across the university. Um, so if I look back at how things have changed in the last five years, I think I would say that that's probably one of the most significant developments. 
I think that's probably enough from me now. So we're going to cut now to a video uh, which will give you an introduction to some of the newer faculty that we've had joining us over the last year and their teaching interests. Perfect. Okay, I'll talk now. Thank you. Good. <coughs> video is three. Uh, <coughs> video is three minutes thirty seconds. Okay. So I'll tell you one minute before it finishes, and then thirty seconds, and then yep. I'm down. <coughs> Who am I going to go to first? I'm not going to take five minutes to talk about applications. I'm probably going to take about one minute. So. Oh, they sent the message first. Yeah. Sure. What happened with fashion today? I mean, this is a kind of Christmassy oh theme already. Yeah. And this is the kind of neutral. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. Oh, well, green, green, <laughs> green. It is. Well, it should be green and red. Green. It is supposed to be green. Yeah. Oh, I tell. <laughs> I can remember this. Yeah. Oh, okay. I reckon I once went through a very distinctive set of buildings and I'm kind of pointing out to him all these different colour, orange, green buildings and so on. And after about five minutes he says, oh, I, I didn't know what any of this was. Oh, can you not see colours then? Well, I can see some colours, but like I wouldn't oh, have yeah. known that was green at all. Oh, really? So what would you... Uh, Greyish blue, sort of. Okay. Oh. I might have known that one was green if that was close. <laughs> No, we didn't discuss what it's our like outfit. Green and red, is it? That get no. Yeah, green, green, and red, green and red, plus other things that are near them, browns yeah, okay. and. Okay. Okay. Blue and yellow, I can see. Does it's it impact you in sort of daily life at all? Anything that it makes very difficult. <laughs> I just look a bit stupid sometimes. <laughs> Can't be a jet pilot, and my wife has to dress me. <laughs> 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 so I don't go out looking terrible. <laughs> sure, you wouldn't. Well, it's probably an advantage actually. So we have 20 people watching, and we've had 235 connections and that sort of include people connecting and then disconnecting, okay. etc. Hmm. But it's 20 people at the moment. Wow, that's pretty good. Mm. I always think it's unlikely that anybody's going to sit and watch the whole thing. Yeah, that's true. It's quite a long time in my mind. Although, I mean, if you want to study here, yeah. then one hour should be. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. It doesn't very well if you can't, I suppose. Any questions at all? Laura? Only one from earlier. Oh no. Okay. But I remember last year, I think yeah. we got them nearer to the question yeah. session, okay. or they came more in when we'd have questions. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see. I've just realised I haven't mentioned as well how people ask questions, so yeah, I'll maybe we'll mention see. that next. So it is usual by email to teaching at OIR, is it? And Can you get them to tweet it? Because I tweet. can't seem to get into my teaching email. Oh really? Oh, yeah. that's a shame. Okay. No, I don't know why. It's one minute. It's, 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 it's so the hashtag is. is um, OI Open Day. OI Open Day, yeah. Because we, we yeah. kind of ask people to send emails to teachers beforehand, so okay. I think it would be best if they tweet. Fine. And if, if it doesn't get answered, then they can email teachers <coughs> afterwards. Fine. Yep. Mm. This video makes me laugh. It really makes me laugh in this video. Have you seen oh, it? that's so funny. Have you seen this? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> it's great. It's very robotic. 30 seconds. <laughs> Luciano's very engaging. He's brilliant. We, we and, think yeah. He's like um, the villain of James Bond or something. <laughs> 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 That's interesting. You should tell him that. You should have yeah. 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 So hopefully that gives you some sort of insight into the work of our faculty here, and in particular obviously our newest faculty, um, all of whom I should say are quite keen to have new DPhil students obviously in particular because we've yet to overload them in the last few years. So um, before I move on to the application process, I want to just flag up that it is possible for people to ask questions in real time during this session. Uh, we're not sitting here checking our email, although we will do that after the event, but the best means to reach us with a question now is to tweet it. And you do so with the hashtag, which is obviously hashtag OII Open Day. With no dashes and no dots in that at all. So that's hashtag OII Open Day. So just a couple of, min uh, a couple of minutes from me on the application process. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, maybe the oddest thing about the Oxford application process is this idea of there being uh, what are called gathered fields or you know, fixed deadlines over the course of the year by which you have to apply. 
Um, it is an oddity, um, but it was introduced, I think, in, originally so that there would be some sort of fairness, if you like, that, that students submitting their applications could get them considered within a relatively sort of quick turnaround uh, and then sort of make a decision as to where to go on to study. Uh, we ourselves use uh, two application deadlines for the DPhil and three for the MSc. The relevant ones in both cases are the November and the January deadline. And then also for the MSc, we also accept applications at the March deadline. Um, I suppose the most sort of generic advice it's worth giving people is simply that we get an awful lot of very, very good applications here. I mean, it's stating the obvious. So, you know, the first thing is that you, you, you have to make sure that your application, you know, first of all, it has to be complete. I mean, that that's, that's goes without saying. Um, and unfortunately, we don't necessarily have any discretion in actually accepting applications which are incomplete. So particularly when it comes to things like references and so on, make sure that you give people enough time to get their materials in and make sure that you yourself uh, you know, are sort of fully aware of, of who submitted what and when. Um, but beyond that, you know, you, you, you have to show us, first of all, that you meet the criteria. Our criteria are quite explicit, I think, on the website. First of all, obviously, in, in all cases, we're looking for clear evidence of academic excellence. And that will be clear from a variety of sources. It should be evident from your transcript, first and foremost, but also, obviously, from academic references, um, from writing samples, which we request, I think, don't we, for both degree courses. That's something I cannot study, emphasise heavily enough. People seem to get confused about this. We need writing samples for you. Um, we also, though, are looking not just for sort of examples of academic evidence, uh, excellence, but, but, but you need to give us some insight as to why this is the best place for you to be. Um, so in the case of the MSc programme, you're asked to write a personal statement of, 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 sort of it's one, basically one page, isn't it? And, you know, in that, you may never have studied the internet before, that's completely fine. But there should be something about this particular course that, 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 that clearly interests you, fascinates you. You need to be knowledgeable about it enough to convince us that, you know, you need to be here. And ideally also give some indication of what you might like to study. With the DFIL programme, I'll ask Eric to say a bit more about this, but you need to have obviously a very convincing DFIL proposal, again, which makes it clear who you might want to study with here and why. Um, the other, I suppose, uh, you know, general general point is is that you know if you have any questions about any part of this application process, please do ask us. It seems, you know, that we always think that the, the, the online documentation is completely clear, that the university websites are clear, but if you can't find something, uh, please do ask. And the best way to do that is to email us on teaching at oii.ox.ac.uk. Um, I think that's the only sort of general notes I want to make on the application process, but I don't know whether Ralph and Eric you want to say a bit more about that, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth just saying again that we that our students come just from the widest variety of disciplinary backgrounds: philosophy, history, computer science, physics, biochemistry, and so on. So there's really a, a very large uh, set of backgrounds, and I think what you want to do in your application, and this is perhaps something that isn't so explicit on the website, is that you want to tell us about the unique strengths that you bring from whatever discipline you come from. And also you want to tell us about what we can offer you. Do you have any holes? Are you perhaps a quantitative researcher who needs qualitative skills? Have you looked at this topic? Do you maybe want to expand it into that? And so on. So I think that's one thing that you can do. I think the other thing you uh, might want to ask is about the writing sample. Given that some of you might never have written about the internet, what kind of writing samples can you submit? And I think the, the answer is that, again, any kind of essay from many disciplines will do as long as it really shows us your academic potential uh, as possibly studying the internet and I think many many different types of essay can, can do that. And in terms of competition we get on average what around sort of 100 applications don't we per year? Uh, For about year. 20 to 30 mm, places yeah. so I think it's it's quite competitive. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to talk about destinations? Talk about that in a minute. Let's carry on okay. with the application process. So, yeah, Eric. Okay, and with the DPhil, it's um, even more competitive than the MSc. We get 50 <coughs> to 60 applicants per year to um, take up about five to seven spots. And I say that not to discourage anybody, but to encourage you to put in the strongest application you possibly can. Really think it through. Really think through what you're trying to say. And in your, um, probably the most important element of that will be this research proposal that we've asked you to write of about 2,500 words. And you know, a lot of people contact me about this and ask my advice after having seen many of these things. And I can give a few, a few bits of advice. First of all, make your proposal about one thing. You may have multiple ideas, you might have lots of things floating around in your head, but we can talk about that if you get an interview. For your proposal, you should stick to one core thing that you think is interesting. It doesn't mean that you're wedded to that for life. You might decide once you get here to, to, to modify it a bit. Um, but this, this idea that you've got, 
should demonstrate that you seriously started to think about the internet as, as something that you're going to research, that somehow that should be clear in that. Um, what is an interesting topic? Um, who, who are you trying to interest in the research? There, there should be some sense that you know where you're coming from in doing this research, that there's a gap in some fields out there that you're interested in. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to have a completely fully developed literature review. You'll have time to do that when you're here, but it sh you should demonstrate that you are aware of the literature that would influence the kind of work you're doing. Also, start to show us that you've thought through seriously some of the questions you might be able to ask about that topic from a social science view of how the internet works and how people engage on the internet. So again, these don't have to be your final research questions, but they should show that you're well along the way of thinking of a real serious topic and what approaches you might be able to use to gather empirical evidence to answer these questions, whether that's qualitative or quantitative evidence or a mix of these. Um, what are some of the methods that you're starting to think about? Even if you just know they exist but need to learn about them once you're here, um, you can say, this is something that I suspect might be useful and I'd like to explore that more. Um, and all of this is because it, compared to other places you might look, North America in particular, doctoral degrees here are much shorter, three to four years. And so we, we, you can't sort of spend three years just bouncing around without any ideas and trying to think of what you're going to do. You need to be able to, in the first year, really start to get dug into your new topic. And so we're looking for people not who have a perfect research proposal on day one, that's what you're here to develop, but people who have an idea, a good core of an idea that they can develop into what's going to be a really strong research proposal that will look good for you as a, as a, um, as a growing academic researcher and also good, look for, good for us as a department here at Oxford. Um, obviously, all the other kinds of things are important as well, your good, strong references and so forth. Now, people also ask about uh, contacting potential supervisors. That's certainly acceptable. Um, we don't expect a potential supervisor to give you back line by line detail on a full proposal you send them, but if you send them a paragraph or two about your general ideas and ask them whether that's the kind of thing they might think about supervising, all of our faculty are happy to answer those sorts of questions and to give you some feedback before you put in your proposal. So I think um, all of these things you should think, think through carefully about how you fit in here, what, kind, what your research will do, who will benefit, and then just try and say that in the most, uh, most compelling way possible. Everybody that is shortlisted, not everybody who applies, but everyone who's shortlisted, <coughs> will get an interview either in person or via Skype um, with uh, me and uh, at least one of your potential supervisors to determine whether you're the kind of person that we want to make an offer to. And as Vicki mentioned earlier, we try very hard to get um, funding, competitive funding from around the university for as many of our doctoral students as we can so that um, you're able to come here and study and not have to worry about you know, racking up a lot of debt and things. Excellent. So uh, that tells us a little bit about uh, the actual application process, how to, how to put your materials together. Uh, again, other questions that students often ask us is, well, why should I do this course? What do I get out of it at the other end? Where do I go? Where do people get jobs and so on? So, I mean, could you both just maybe say a little bit about that for me? Yeah, I can go first maybe and then. Yeah. So, so I think um, the doctoral students, we, there's a lot of paths out of here. We, we only had the doctoral degree for seven years? 2006, yeah. Seven years, seven years now. Um, so the first several years of people who started have started to go out and get mm -hmm. positions. Some of them have become academics and have gotten academic positions at uh, you know, leading institutions. Others have gone off to work in industry. We've got several working at places like Google or Facebook or um, uh, yeah, some consulting firms and things like that. So there's not just one mode of, of leaving this place. It's not like we're trying to make carbon copies of ourselves who go off and only get academic positions. Um, but the, the kinds of things they're doing are all interesting, and, and it's, we, we have them come back on occasion to talk to some of our current doctoral students, and they're all doing fascinating things. Um, so I think uh, what I, I, I tell all our doctoral students is that the things you will do after here is what you make of it. As a multidisciplinary department, it's different than if you get a degree in a, you know, say if you get a sociology degree, you know, you'll go apply for jobs in sociology. Here, you can apply for lots of different kinds of things, and you have to shape that in, during your time um, here in, in the program. Well, in the master's course, we've had it for five years, and so there are some kind of, st not statistical, but some regularities, some, but some patterns emerging. And I think, uh, from what I could tell, this is about 50-50. So from the masters, there are about 50% who go out into further study, some of them here, others at, again, leading institutions to do a PhD in, in lots of different topics, actually, in sociology, in media and communications, in law, in politics, and so on. Uh, so that's about half our master's students. 
Um, and the other half go and work in lots of different places. And I think uh, they're very enterprising and successful in doing that, if I may say so. Uh, so we've had people go into non-governmental organizations, into political jobs, into industry, typically with a kind of research focus, because I think they, they do do research in those organizations about how the internet works. And I think that's those are great skills to have. We've had several students working at Google, we've had <coughs> Amazon, Microsoft, and so on. Uh, several students working on startups. One came back from Silicon mm -hmm. Valley the other day, actually, right, and yeah. said he had a, a, a new firm with five people who were doing health advice over the internet. So that's the kind of typical uh, job that people have, where they can really, I think, use the skills that they've learned here. Yeah. And can I just mention, too, since sure. you brought up the idea of MSc students going on, um, for those of you who don't have an MSc from here, you don't worry about the fact that you'll be disadvantaged in the application process for the DPhil. Um, it's absolutely level, level playing field. Mm -hmm. There's no advantage nor disadvantage to having an MSc from us. Each year, maybe one or two students from the MSc program will be accepted under the DPhil, but you know, three or four or five from elsewhere will also be accepted under the DPhil. Uh, you'll meet Ulrika in a moment, who does have a master's from here before she got, came back a couple years later and got the DPhil. Um, but uh, I'd say she's the exception rather than the rule. So it, it certainly doesn't hurt you to get a master's here, but it also doesn't hurt you to have gotten a master's elsewhere. Yeah. Vicky, did you say, uh, returning to funding, so I am out of order here, but did you say that, that the January deadline is the one that you most typically that, need for yeah. almost all scholarships? So you really want to use the second deadline for the master's, which doesn't even apply to the DPhil. You don't yeah, have a yeah. large deadline, but you want to apply for the second deadline uh, for most of the scholarships and the funding that's available. Yeah. No, that is really, really important. There'll be things we keep remembering that we should have said. Anyway, um, we ought to move on and take some questions now, I think, perhaps. Uh, so, Laura, have we got anything coming in over Twitter? I've got quite a few uh, <laughs> come in. Um, I think I'll pick this one about um, a DFIL query. Um, chaps asked, write in a DFIL proposal, how does one indicate any work that is already underway, work in papers, etc.? I mean, if you're already doing things that are underway, you can mention that, and if it's been published, cite what you've already done. Or simply say, this is a, a project that I've undertaken this far and as a pilot, and I'd like to develop further on a DFIL program. I mean, all of that will show us that you've started to think seriously about the topic, that it's not just something you dreamed up over a weekend that you think might be fun. That's absolutely true. But obviously, on the other hand, what you couldn't do is come here with, say, three already published papers and say, no. I want to put these together for a no, doctorate. Exactly. Yeah. So the point is that it has to be a new project, a new piece of work, but you may well have done things that contribute to that which indicate your seriousness. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, another question has uh, been tweeted. Will the Institute ensure or at least help me with securing a placement at any organisation at time of doing my thesis? Um, any master's one or default doesn't it say? It doesn't specify, no. Okay. I, mean, I think um, we do have a lot of connections mm -hmm. with a lot of organizations. In fact, we have, I mean, we don't formally call them internships, but we have a lot of links with different organizations where they might need research, where they might have data, where you can use your skills to do your thesis work in particular. Uh, we can't ensure it, we can't guarantee it. It tends to be a question of matching up different students to different things that are either ongoing here as well or in other organizations that we have links with. I think the issue uh, is not so much whether we can guarantee it, but the, the issue tends often to be, do you have the time uh, to quickly kind of work with an organization and put in the time to both work with them and for them, if you like, and do all your required work and do your thesis, which should be your main focus. Uh, but it's worked successfully on a number of occasions. Yeah, and it's a model that we are quite keen to pursue to the extent that we do each year have two or three, uh, if you like, placements already lined up, which we hope that students might might fill. But did you want to say anything about well, the and, and for the default front, certainly a lot of our default students have organizations that they, they work with over the course of their, their studies. And for the um, ESRC funded ones, we have several, we have a at least one ESRC studentship each year and possibly others based on the comp competition, there's also funding available to spend some time with organizations to, during the course of their doctoral studies. So I think there's um, a lot of ways of developing that. I mean, our, our faculty here are incredibly well connected in uh, different organizations around the world and they can help facilitate those sorts of uh, um, engagements and placements. Okay. Um, oh, there's a question directed, I think, more at you, Ulrika. Okay. Um, 
a potential student is curious about research tools at your disposal, can you share three exciting OI resources? I don't know if you're able to answer that. So in terms of like programs or does it specify anything? It doesn't specify. I mean, I would say in general um, there are a lot of research tools available, whether that is like a statistic program or uh, whether that's help from another um, faculty member. So I think there are a lot of possibilities to get support for whatever you may need um, in order to, to pursue your research. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Well, and, and for instance, we could mention that one of our um, popular courses is called Digital Social Research that teaches people how to do things like scrape data from the web and, and to program in, in Python in order to be able to process that data and work with it. Um, we've got a lot of people here doing what is called big data research, where they use the infrastructure that's built up here in order to scrape millions of tweets or uh, you know huge huge networks that they're able to, to gather from Facebook. Um, so I think we've got a lot of support for those sorts of activities. And also, just in terms of um, you know sort of infrastructure, it is worth noting, obviously, that because we are the Internet Institute, we do try very hard to give our, our access our students good access to our computing resources here whether that be places for data storage, data management or so on, or, you know, sort of the, the latest software for, you know, collection analysis of data and so on. So, so yeah, I think, I think we do pretty well on that. And actually the other thing that's worth noting is a lot of our students help each other out, um, whether mm. that's with little sort of, you know, programming or coding exercises to help in, in each other's thesis work. That seems to be quite a common um, exchange, it's a gift economy, yeah. I mean, I think it's also worth saying this is kind of not answering the question at all, but if this puts <laughs> people off, um, I mean, one question that sometimes comes uh, from students is, do I need to have programming skills in order yeah. to do the Masters or the DPhil? And the thing about that is that absolutely not. I mean, we've had students who do nothing of the kind, who write a kind of normative philosophical thesis that's based mainly on texts. But we do also have a lot of students who are using the most advanced tools and mm -hmm. helping each other and uh, providing each other with kind of insider knowledge, if you like, about all the different things that are available now for scraping and visualizing as well. Yeah, but as, as Ralph says, we've got a lot of students who do purely qualitative work. You know, I teach the advanced qualitative course in a, in a number of our theses. Some very good theses last year were done uh, primarily using qualitative methods. Excellent. Let's take, yeah, we've got time for another question at least. Um, a uh, question from a student, it sounds like they might be studying at Oxford already. They've asked, if you're already at Oxford, are the offers for the DPhil conditional? I, mean, I think they're asking about whether they're conditional on the, the marks they get in their Masters here at Oxford. Well, they, yes, that would be true. They'd have to finish their Masters mm -hmm. successfully at the, uh, um, the expected you know, upper second uh, level that we look for. But that would be the same for anybody on any master's, for anybody, course, any master's course. It would usually be conditional upon successful completion, yes. yes. Um, the only difference, though, that applies, I think, specifically to existing Oxford students, if you're applying for a doctorate here, you do have to use a reference from your existing master's course. Mm. Um, you, you, your, your dossier wouldn't be considered without that, so you can't just reuse all your references from your previous institution. Uh, yeah, one more. Um, if I... Get, got an offer, can I apply for a deferral until next year? Does it say on what grounds? Just ask that. Um, no, okay. that's the question, so I think... Yeah, Do you, you might want to answer that, actually. Um, <laughs> you can get a deferral. Um, basically, you have to have fulfilled your conditions, your academic conditions with the department, um, and your conditions with the college. Normally, um, the conditions you get from a college are um, financial conditions, so to prove that you can fund it. And it has to be on exceptional circumstances. Um, I believe it's sort of usually on medical grounds um, or things like military service, bereavement. Yeah. yeah. Those are the um, exceptions. I mean, it, it, it doesn't apply, for example, if you just apply once and say, oh, I want to take a year out. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That wouldn't be acceptable. Yeah. And, but then you could, of course, reapply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is also worth bearing in mind, perhaps, that if you're seeking external funding, that that obviously is in a separate decision to whether that can be deferred. Um, I've been chairing the Social Sciences Scholarships Panel for the last few years, and one of the most frequent questions I get um, is, is uh, it's sort of around the midpoint of the year, is whether or not students who've got places can actually defer their funding. And again, you know, be aware that that can usually only be undertaken in very exceptional circumstances. We, we might also want to mention, too, in terms of funding, mm. um, that the uh, there, there is this unfortunate gap between your... Um, 
acceptance into the program and, mm -hmm. and determining whether you've got funding. So you won't find out a whole package at once. That's good and that's out of our control yeah. as a department because of the university mechanisms. Yeah. Um, but we do our best to find to get those answers for you as quickly as yep. possible so that you can make your decision as to you've got offers from other institutions as well. Yep. I'm thinking we should break now and maybe hear a little bit from Ulrika and then we'll come back and take some more questions in a bit. So Ulrika, okay. what do you what do you like about the OI or what do you wish you'd known at this point or what would you so, I mean, from a student perspective, I would say there are about four things um, that are really great about the OII. Um, so, first of all, I mean, the one that you already mentioned, so it's a great, great place for uh, cutting-edge research. And there's so much going on every day, like so many talks on so many um, interesting topics ranging through all these uh, different, um, different disciplines, uh, probably more than you can actually attend. Um, and with that, actually, the second point is the, the really great supervision. So that was definitely part um, of why I came here as well. Um, so to have supervisors who really, I mean, who obviously know about the area, but also uh, care really about your research and um, help you to, well, to move forward in your degree. And then the third point is, um, well, the great student community. I mean, you said, you mentioned the default breakfast or whatever. I mean, it's there's a lot of com sense of community um, among us, and I think that's really important kind of to help out each other, and um, I think that's, that's definitely great. And then the last part, um, I mean, just uh, this, well, what you said at the beginning, basically, it's a really nice uh, atmosphere in the department. Um, it's not very hierarchical, and I think you can do a lot just um, in terms to make your own OII experience. Um, so if we want to set something up, um, I'll just send an email to you or somebody else and just say, I want to do this, and there's always support for that. So I think it's just a great place to, to really do what you want to do in this time that you're here. So, for example, you're trying to make connections with the astrophysics yeah, department exactly, at the moment. Yeah, so, about, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah so there's definitely an opportunity for students to contribute. Yeah. Which isn't very connected to your detail, no. but <laughs> this you is can true. move these interests forward. Yeah, exactly. What about, um, I mean, we've been talking a lot about life at the OII and supervision, those academic processes, but, but what about college life too? Which college are you at? I'm at Balliol College. At Balliol, okay. And, and, and what, how much or how little time do you spend there? What's, what's it good for? How did you choose and so on? Um, so yeah, I do spend time there. I mean, I live there, so <laughs> definitely. Um, I think in general, I mean, when you're, I also had this question kind of what college shall I choose? Because I mean, you look through all these colleges and all look kind of, I mean, some have advantages and disadvantages, obviously. Um, I think, I mean, for graduate students, it's mostly about um, the social life that you have there. I mean, the application is evaluated by, by the department, so it's not really dependent on any college choice. Um, but you may want to check uh, the colleges in terms of accommodation, for example, um, the accommodation that they provide, uh, or in terms of scholarships that uh, they might have. Um, and then just basically... Um, read what they offer and then just um, make a choice. I mean, in the end, I know very few people who are really unhappy about their colleges. So I think it's just, you're part of that community then as well. And it's, yeah. it's usually great. Yeah. I mean, it is usually great. And everybody gets a college. That's the important thing to note. So it may look very complicated when you're applying. You have this decision about whether or not you identify colleges you wish to apply to, whether you want to have them allocated for you. Yeah. Um, either is fine. It doesn't impact on your, you know, your acceptance by the university at all. Um, if you do want to make a decision, though, yes, absolutely do what Ulrika has just suggested, which is to do some background research. There are lists on our website of which colleges take our students, because not all colleges do. <coughs> um, perhaps another consideration is whether or not you want to go to a graduate-only college or not. Yours isn't, is it? So It isn't, um, but really that <coughs> depends on what you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done my master's in a graduate-only college at St. Cross. Um, that was also great, so... So you um, obviously put down a college choice or no choice at the application stage. You would then be accepted by the department and the university. And after that, usually the, the college decision occurs between at that point, usually around about sort of March and, and the end of, end of August. So again, it's just something to be aware of that, as, as Eric said, a lot of these decisions are timed. So they don't occur at the same point in time, which would be much more convenient. But it isn't something to worry about. So everybody who is accepted in the department will get a college place. 
and you know a lot of those, as, as Ulrika said, come with these extra benefits of so things like accommodation, um, you know, sort of sporting opportunities, social activities, exactly. funding for research trips, and so on. And, and it is an important part. Um, uh, it's often said that we make a big deal about being multidisciplinary here at the OII, um, but obviously colleges were the ultimate multidisciplinary institution before we even arrived. Um, I wonder if you could just say a little bit about the master's course as well, mm -hmm. given that you, you did that. Now, you were, you were working consultancy, were you, at the time? Mm -hmm. So what made you think you needed to go and do a master's in this area? Well, so, um, I mean, <coughs> basically, I mean, the, the master's is a very intense one-year program, um, but it's also very good. So and it really gave me a grounding uh, in social sciences, which I didn't have before. I was coming from information systems, um, so it was really... Um, a good way to be introduced and I think I couldn't have started the default right now without that knowledge. Um, I think it is very intense especially in the first term um, where kind of everything is new. You're new to Oxford um, and um, then you have exams at the end but um, especially over the course of the, um, the masters it all comes together and um, I think it's a great way from basically working on the on the basics of social dynamics uh, and technology and regulations to your final project in the last term. Um, so I think it was really, really a great experience in that sense. And you actually won the thesis prize, didn't you, I think, which yes, yes to be congratulated upon. You shouldn't embarrass it. No, <coughs> no, no, it was not a too great much, no. thesis, it was a fantastic thesis. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and obviously, again, it set the stage for, for the default work that you're doing now. We're going to take some more questions in a minute, but I suppose the last question I would ask you is whether there are any things that you think people ought to know at this stage whilst they're compiling their application. Are there any things that you wish you'd known when you were applying? Are there any things that we've forgotten to mention? I mean, in general, it definitely turned out to be better than I <laughs> even expected. So, um, I think really just um, take time to, to write your application, write a strong statement. I think that's really important, not just write something but actually take time have somebody else read it discuss it maybe with somebody else um, because it's so competitive and it's um, otherwise probably difficult to get in but I mean you've read mine so I don't very good That's, um, <laughs> yeah excellent and I, I suppose the other thing it's worth mentioning is actually the other reason you're quite a good example of a student to have sitting here is that you're not just supervised at the OII are you so you also receive supervision from outside the department, which is another example of how we collaborate across a wider university. Yeah, definitely. So I'm working um, on a topic in relation to internet use and health outcomes. So I have somebody here from the OI who's more working on kind of information seeking and, and internet use in that sense, and then somebody else from the Department of Primary Care. Um, and I think that's just a perfect combination to really look at the topic from different um, points of view. Um, and that is maybe another point um, that is good when you're writing your default application. Really um, try to to find find out more details about your your potential supervisor and be in contact with them um, before, because I think the supervisor really makes makes a difference of your um, experience here in Oxford. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to suggest we take some. Oh, would you like to ask? No, I mean else? I was just going to ask Eric actually. How many of our default students are co-supervised with other departments? Because the majority is not, but I can think of two or three cases yeah, at I mean, least. The majority are, but we, we certainly have a good collection of um, maybe half a dozen who have supervisors or co-supervisors outside the department. Um, and we're very much open to that if it adds to the students' uh, work. Um, we're, and we're I don't think you need to worry so much about that in your application. Yeah. We're probably aware that if, for example, yeah. you have a very detailed topic about Africa or China or something like that, then we might look at yeah. although, the rest of Oxford. Although if you know yeah. somebody that you might be interested in, do you mention that? Sure. That's yeah. fine. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay, let's go back and take some more questions, I think. Um, I think sort of added to that, we've had an email about um, supervision, somebody wants to apply for the DPhil. Um, this person's identified four potential supervisors for the topic of their interest which is at the intersection of different research areas, um, digital exclusion, global social policy, ICT4Dev. Would you recommend um, the student to contact 
all four of them with their research proposal or would you rather them only speak to one potential supervisor? I, I would discourage people from sort of spamming the entire faculty <laughs> with the same email. Uh, one of the things that, if you haven't been here, you won't know, is we're a very small building, even though we've got, so we, we're in very tight quarters, but that means we talk to each other. Yeah. And if everyone says, oh, I just got this email from this student who seems interested in something you're doing, they're like, well, I got the same one, and I got the same one, I got, um, <laughs> it probably doesn't set the best first impression. No. Um, Instead, I think if, if there's one person in particular you think you want to uh, possibly contact, start with that, and mm -hmm. they might recommend that you contact somebody else. Um, or send it to Eric first. Or send, send it, it to Eric. First. You can always can send it to me as, a, the, as the director person. of doctoral program, mm -hmm. yep. and I'd be happy to facilitate your introduction to the person I think that it, we think might be most appropriate for supervising that. That happens all the time, and I'm very happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing happens at the master's level. So don't send it to several people. Send it to me, and I can pass it on to the most relevant person. Based on what I know, I mean, otherwise you can go directly to yeah. that person. Yeah. The other thing is perhaps worth flagging up um, is that I know, I know it's different across different disciplines, and certainly, you know, for here, the norm is that, as you said before, you do need to have a proposal in the hand before you start approaching potential supervisors. I know, particularly the sciences, is often much more common that you, you simply find somebody whose work you really like and you want to work with, and then mm -hmm. you approach them and say, you know, what, what projects can I do? And you know, just to be clear that you know the latter approach it doesn't go down very well here. You know, you won't get taken quite so seriously. Um, you know, the best way to get a really considered response from our faculty is to put together a you know really you know just a couple of paragraphs and say I really yeah, exactly. want to work on this. Is this something you'd be interested in? Can we have a conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so yeah, just to, it's, it's often hard to sort of work out these unwritten rules, but but I think it's something to be quite explicit about. Another one. Um, I think you've touched on this, Eric, when you were talking earlier about the research proposal, but um, this prospective student wants to know how detailed should it be, the research proposal, and do you expect them, a PhD applicant to have conducted a com comprehensive literature review prior to the drafting of the research proposal? So, comprehensive? No. I mean, we don't expect a comprehensive literature review. What we want um, is to show that you've really started to seriously engage with some literature and that you know what the big opportunities are there for new research. So if you if you come in and you, you're talking about, um, I don't know, any topic that has a lot of work out there and you don't seem to be aware of any of that, that would be quite quite worrying for us if we looked yeah. at that application. Um, but if you, it, you also don't have to show that you're exhaustively familiar with everything that's been written on the topic. Um, so I think somewhere in between is really what you're aiming for. Okay. Uh, completely different question. Um, Actually, this uh, potential applicant sent two questions. I think I'll read them because they're sort of linked to each other. Um, one of them is, how common is it for students to take the one plus one program? And um, do they need to apply for a scholarship to both MBA faculty and OII? <laughs> wow. I'm not that's sure I can answer the second one anyway. <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure we can answer. That's a, that's a good one. You've stamped yeah. us. No, I think the... Uh, uh, I think the, the sh shorter answer is that uh, we've had a few applicants for the one plus one last year, but that was really only the first year, if I recall correctly. So there would have been only a few, and um, I'm sure there will be more this year. I think the funding issue is a little bit tricky because um, you would probably need to think about also you know, which you're going to do first of the yep. each of the ones. The one plus one, by the way, uh, is on the website. It's it's a combination of our masters with the MBA or of a ma of the MBA in one year with another degree at, at the, the business school. university at the business school. Sorry. Um, so I think that would need to be looked at on a case by case basis because you'd need to figure out very carefully which combinations of funding are available both here within the OII at the university mm -hmm. and also at the business school. And I suspect that at the business school. That might be a, a quite different process, which I don't think I know too much about. No, actually. and obviously there are there are scholarships which are unique to us, unique to the business school, mm. and there are scholarships which are operated by the university, like the Clarendon Fund. As far as I know, the Clarendon Fund doesn't have a mechanism for allocating funds to two separate masters courses in this way. What about Rhodes? But Rhodes does, I believe. So oh, we right. have um, uh, we've got one Rhodes scholar this year who, incidentally, I think is going to go on and do the the MBA possibly. But um, right. obviously, the, the point normally is that they will fund two years of graduate study. So in theory. If you identify your two master's courses in advance, that would normally be acceptable, I believe. Yeah. But I will check on that. I think you may have, you may have stumped us when I asked that question. 
Um, time for one more? Or? We've, we've got time for a couple more, yeah. I think, at least, yeah. Um, are there any opportunities for work on OIO research projects? That's a good one. <laughs> I think Ulrika well, knows this uh, and perhaps can talk about it as well, but I think on the Masters, again, there are many such opportunities. Uh, there are always many research projects going on here, and I think, again, it's a question of time and, and also of a good fit between your needs and because we really want to tie it, perhaps, to your thesis work or to coursework because we want to make sure that you get the best out of the master's experience. So there are lots of different things to choose from. There are also regulations about, yeah. for example, if you want to uh, work uh, on a funded basis while you're doing the master's, uh, then certain rules about, I think, that you can only work two days per week. Is that right? Well, Something like yeah. that. There are different <laughs> rules. You can only work on a funded basis for so many days or hours, but there are plenty of opportunities and uh, lots of students have in the past done that and I think the benefit is that there are so many sources of data there's so many ongoing research projects that we have where there's just too much data too many interviews too many different types of things that we could do with this work uh, but that you benefit from in working with us and and hopefully it's a benefit to you Definitely. So uh, in my case, for example, I was working on OXIS, well, the Oxford Internet Surveys, which is um, an biannual survey on Internet use in Britain. And I think that really helped me to, to develop my skills in quantitative data analysis, uh, which was then again helpful for my thesis. Um, so that's what I was doing during my master's course. And quite related to this is also teaching. So you can do some teaching assistance as well. Um, so I will also be doing some teaching uh, assistance next term in uh, advanced quant analysis. So I think there are a lot of um, a lot of opportunities around, and I think it's it's just a good way to be engaged with the with what the department does. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say at the doctoral level, the vast majority of doctoral students will have worked with faculty on research projects <coughs> by the time they finish here. Sometimes on multiple different projects. Uh, so I think. That's something that we absolutely encourage, and it happens all the time. Mm. In fact, it's, it's not only more common at DPhil level, it's easier at DPhil level, yes. simply because you haven't got so many classes to go to. We're, we're a bit wary of encouraging our MSc students, I think, to do too much paid employment, even if it's clearly on our own projects, and for good for good reasons. But uh, yeah, And teaching also, I should say, is, is more common at DPhil level, isn't it? There yes. aren't many opportunities at the master's level, but we do try and find ways of involving our DPhil students in our teaching programme, and that's seen mm -hmm. in other departments as well. Yeah, absolutely. Probably last one. Um, uh, am I able to do the MSc part-time? Ah, no. <laughs> I think we've got time for another question. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's a, a very straightforward one. Yeah. It can't be done. Yeah, and not just us, that is actually the university regulations. So, yeah. right. I go. don't think I've asked this one because I've just had it retweeted. Um, somebody's applying for the MSc, it sounds like, for the second time. And they want to know, are there any additional requirements or expectations? Because it's their second time. Mm. We would treat it as a completely new application. No. We, wouldn't, we wouldn't compare across year groups, would we? We would merely no. take it on its own within the cohort in which it appears. Mm -hmm. No, but I mean, I think if there are good reasons why the, the student has <coughs> substantially enhanced their skills or they've yeah. gone out to work or done some research, uh, then by all means mention all these things and mention that you're uh, uh, doing that. Yeah, and from our perspective the requirements haven't changed have they, in the last year, so there's nothing different if they've applied once that they've used to do again this year. Yeah, so that's that's good. Okay. Um, is it worth just briefly the next application deadlines? Do you happen to have those? What, the dates? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, the next one is the 24th of January um, and that's for both MSc and DPhil. Um, and then after that we're not taking any more doctoral applications. Um, the MSc has another deadline which is the 14th of March. Um, as we said earlier though, if you are looking at applying for funding, uh, we recommend you apply by the January deadline. Yeah, that's very important. And as the uh, admissions officer always says, please get all your documents yeah. in line before you get all your referees to make sure that they're sending in their references, get all your transcripts because it does take time to get all that material yeah. together. And you can start doing that as soon as you start your application. You don't have to wait for all your materials to be complete before you ask your referees. Yeah, because unfortunately, if, if you are missing a reference and it's not all in time yeah. for the deadline, it will be considered in the next application deadline. So it is very important that you do that ahead of time. Yeah. 
So we're about to finish. Anything that we've forgotten to say? I think we've been fairly complete. I think so. No? Okay. So obviously, uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, this particular recording, I think, will be available on our website. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it will take for us to code it, but it will appear fairly soon. Um, in addition, it's worth having a really close look at the materials on the website. Obviously, we've got many other videos um, which can give you some sort of insight into not just what we say, but who we are and, and what we're like. Um, but in addition, please really do read carefully the, the, the information contained there. You know, we get so many questions by email. You know, do I need to include this in my application? What's the deadline, etc.? If you actually read, you know, read them to us carefully, it, it is all there. But as I said before, if you don't find what you need, then please do just approach us and ask. So the best ways to get hold of us going forward, um, first of all, if you've just got a general question you want to ask that we haven't answered today, please email it to us um, or tweet us, I suppose, perhaps in the next little half hour or so. The email address is teaching at oii.ox.ac.uk. And obviously we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can with any queries. But thank you very, very much, everybody, for participating. And thank you guys for watching.